Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, Plaza Art. Thank you to everyone who signed up. I can't, when I heard that it sold out within like 30 hours or whatever it was, it just, it really made my heart happy. Um, thank you to the amazing intro, Tara, and to all the people who put this event together from Catherine, who originally invited me for the event, and to Allie and Kim, Lauren, Scott, Tara, and the entire Daniel Smith and Plaza team for putting this event together. Um, also want to thank our vendors who put that great little supply kit together. What a treat. We have the Daniel Smith dot card. We have the arch paper. Princeton sent us a beautiful brush and the Aqua Elite series is actually one of my favorite brush series. So it was such so exciting that you guys get to see that. And then also the stencil by crafters workshop. So I wanted just to say a special thanks to everybody. I'm excited to paint with you and I'm going to go ahead and switch to where the magic happens. <laughs> Here is my contact info if any of you want to keep in touch after this event. I would absolutely love to see your artwork. And if you, any of you want some feedback on it, you can email me at bk at watercolor4.com. I also have an active YouTube with over 150 free videos on there if you want to explore more of my techniques. And I am active on Instagram at watercolor4. And then this is my website if you'd like to see a gallery of my work and more information on upcoming events. Today we're going to be exploring a few of my favorite colors and techniques. We're gonna be painting a beautiful lily flower. <laughs> Some of you may have seen this on my YouTube. I have a little video on there of me painting this. And some of you have taken my in-person classes. I spied you with my little eye in the gallery. <laughs> Thanks for signing up. So you probably have done a lily pond with me before. So I'm excited to see how yours turns out today. I'll put this back up at the very end if anyone missed the information. So these are the my 18 favorite colors by Daniel Smith and you each got an oversized dollop, dollop <laughs> of paint. So these are my core colors along the right side. Here is a picture of them swatched out. And I nicknamed this my limitless palette because I feel that with these six colors, I can mix nearly any color up. Um, my absolute favorite colors also because they all get along so well in mixing. So today we'll be primarily using these colors, the Hansa Yellow Light, Quinacridone Sienna, Quinacridone Magenta, I'm sorry, red, <laughs> Quinacridone Magenta, Thalo Turquoise, and Thalo Blue Red Shade. If you have similar colors, that's great. If you got the kit and have the dot card, hopefully this will be enough paint to get you through today's lesson. In addition to these colors on the dot card, there's two colors I like to use for splatter effects. That's the Bronzite Genuine and the Kyanite Genuine. Both of these colors have this little bit of shimmer in them. So a really quick tip is that any colors that have shimmer in them, especially with the Daniel Smith line, have a pushy effect. So when you splatter them or drop them or pour them into wet washes, they tend to be super bossy and push things out of the way. So if you've got some shiny colors, you don't know how to use them yet, or you haven't played with them, we're going to play with them today. And I have a special guest. I know it isn't, I think it was on the supply list, but not in the kit. You don't need to have this today, but I highly recommend it. It's one of the pushiest, bossiest, and sassiest colors Daniel Smith has. <laughs> um, it's called Iridescent Electric Blue. And when watered all the way down, it looks like a beautiful sky color. And when splattered into wet washes, it is just magic. One more thing, I think that they may be able to add this to the chat box. If not, you can email me and I can send you a copy. This is my 
18 favorite colors by Daniel Smith on the dot card swatched out. And there's a little legend on the bottom to make it easy to see which ones are transparent or semi-transparent, which ones are granulating, and which ones are Primatech colors, which are from the mineral series. Now you'll notice that all of my core colors for today, so that's these ones, they're all transparent, except for the hands the yellow light is semi-transparent. So that's really key in my pouring process and something to think about if you're going to explore watercolor pouring more. Transparent colors work well for pouring because they stain the paper and you can add more than one pour on top of each other. Buffy, I have a quick question. Yes. Is that because the, the pigments or the minerals in the paint are heavier than, um, than others in those particular colors so that they, like it's actually the weight or, or what is the reason that that pushes the other colors out of the way? So in the kit, you guys each got these wonderful brochures. Save these, don't throw these away. These are just priceless because the more you study watercolor, the more you find that those things really do matter, whether or not it's granulating, how staining it is. So up in the legend up here, it says the level of staining it is from one being non-staining to four being high staining. And the colors on my palette that I use for pouring are very high staining. So think of it almost like it's dyeing the paper. Like a, imagine girls, and, and no offense, gentlemen, but when we dye our hair with a darker color, if we get it on our skin, how <laughs> the mess it makes. Imagine that these are staining the cotton fibers of the, of the paper. Now, a lot of times, the more granulating it is, the less staining it is. So it's kind of just sitting on top of the paper. It's not seeping down into it. So if you pour on top of it, sometimes it disturbs the first layer. So oftentimes, not only do I pour with these staining transparent colors, but I also, if I'm doing traditional painting, I will glaze with them as well. And I'll save my granulating colors for areas where it's kind of a, a one and done area or for my final step, um, unless, <laughs> I want to have some lifting. So I do a lot of lifting. I'll share a little bit about that today, but I can go, we can literally spend two hours just talking about the colors. I'm, it's, it is as fun to me to swatch colors and explore and study them as it is to paint. And I have a drawer of swatches <laughs> that are as equally valuable to me as all my paintings together. But that's a really good question. Thank you. Moving on to our reference photo, we also sent a piece of line art. Now you'll notice that I didn't draw every last petal on the inside and because I didn't know what all you'd be using to transfer this image. So I'm going to transfer and then slightly either draw or paint my petals. Because if you look at our reference photo, it's almost completely white. You see that? There's not clearly defined lines. So to do transferring, oftentimes what I do is I'll draw my drawing on like copy paper or on regular smooth tracing paper. And once I get my image done, and if you follow my YouTube, you'll know how messy <laughs> the drawings start out as. I'll then take it and transfer it onto my watercolor paper. And that way my watercolor paper doesn't get all screwed up from all the erasing and all the line work. So I have two ways of transferring. The first one is I'll use a graphite stick and I will literally draw on the back of the paper along where the lines are and just put some heavy graphite. Or this paper is amazing. I don't know how many of you have tried it before. If you have, um, leave a note in the chat box. But I started teaching a class in Fallbrook and the artists there taught me about this wax-free Soral transfer paper. It actually erases, which is unheard of. And it's not glossy or waxy. 
So this paper literally acts like a pencil. Most transfer paper, if any of you have tried using it, it won't erase, super, super dark, and it is waxy, so it kind of repels your paint. It can be real messy, too, if you drag your hand, <laughs> whereas with this one, if you drag your hand, it will actually erase. So you, the way you use it is you put the dark side down. And I'm going to do a couple pieces with my pencil and the rest of it with the transfer paper. So you can just see how I do it. The other nice thing about the transfer paper is that I will fold it up and carry it in my art kit and use it over and over again. So this one will last me for a really long time. One last thing, if you're using transfer paper, the heavier you push down and put pressure, the darker your line will be, and the lighter pressure you apply will be, a, of course, a lighter version. For this, I recommend making sure your lily pad lines are dark enough so you can see them. And maybe around the flower, just being a little bit lighter handed. Set that right down the middle. One other area really quick to discuss is that some artists found this little bud to be a little tricky to paint. So if you want, you can just completely omit that if you feel that you're more of a beginner artist and you want an easier practice painting for today. Now I just, I put the dark side down and remember down here is where I use the graphite stick. And from here up, I'll be using the transfer paper. A tip is to use a red pencil or red pen when you're tracing your lines. And then that way you'll remember <laughs> what you've traced so far, especially if you're doing a really intricate transfer it never fails. I'll go through all the process and I'll lift up and I'll have forgotten a part. So actually any color would work, blue or red. A quick reminder about the joy of Zoom is sometimes we have connectivity issues. There's a whole lot of reasons that Zoom can, we could have interference, it can kick us out. And if that happens, you can just log right back in and our wonderful hosts can let you back into our room. Down here is where the pencil is. When I'm doing a transfer or tracing, I do try and do minimal amount of information because sometimes when you're pouring, the, the watercolor will kind of take over and you might get some areas where maybe, maybe the watercolor dries in a way that you see a whole nother lily pad form. <laughs> So I do a very minimalistic transfer. And you'll see that down here where I did the graphite stick is you can't really tell which is which, can you? They're, it's the same quality of transfer. They're both erasable and neither are going to cause the paint to, to repel. So then I'll just take this and I'll fold it dark side in. And save it for next time. If you get a little bit on your fingers, <laughs> you might want to just really quick rinse your fingers off, get a tissue and wipe them off so you don't end up getting graphite all over your face and then going out to the store and going shopping and realizing 
you've got a charcoal nose. Have any of you done that? I think it goes with the whole, I drank my pink water people group. I'm perpetually covered in whatever product I'm using to create. Whatever. <laughs> um, you can also save your line work. So by doing my drawings on, like I said, copy paper or tracing paper, I actually save these in a folder too. And that way, if I want to go and try painting that subject again, I can paint it over and over again. I saw an artist recently and I was so excited. It was a floral artist. And they drew their flowers and then they cut them up and put them in a little box. And so when they went to do their compositions, they would take that box out and take the different flower drawings and juxtapose them and move them around and create new compositions over and over again. So love it. Really quick, I wanted to open up the beautiful brush that got sent in our kits, the Aqua Elite. Now, something really cool about these brushes is there's so many different shapes and sizes to choose from on the back of the packet. Look at that. They even have a quill, which is really hard to find in a synthetic. So synthetic means that no animals were used in the making of these brushes. Kind of cool. It says right here, animal friendly. So these were created to mimic the Kalinsky sable hair. A great little brush. Uh oh. Anyway, so it comes with some little tiny bit of sizing on it. So before you start painting, you're going to want to just wet that in your paper. And shape it. So I'll be using the round size 10, the half inch angle shader, and the three quarter inch oval shape. So if you don't have these exact brushes, any wash brush will work. A square wash, flat wash, oval wash, angle wash. You just basically want one to apply color and one to blend the color out. If you only have this brush, then what I recommend is to have two water dishes, one for dirty water and one for clean. So you can put the color down, rinse your brush out quickly, and then you can use the same brush for spreading. Hopefully you all have some little mixing cups as well. These are about three inches, two and a half to three inches. You can use old applesauce containers, little soy sauce dishes, go uh, thrift store hunting. I love going to vintage and thrift stores and finding things to repurpose for my art supplies. I'm going to go ahead and mix up a color. You may want to have an extra sheet of paper also to swatch out your colors. So if you've never done watercolor pouring before, we're going to have water on the paper, water in our paint. And so whatever your mix is of paint, it's going to dilute when it goes onto the paper. So even the areas where I'm direct painting in a traditional way, I use a lot of water. So I tend to mix my paints a little bit brighter and bolder than most people are accustomed to. So we have our swatch to make sure we've mixed up enough. I also have the pipettes. These are sold like on Amazon, or you can have a straw and you put it in the cup, you cover the top of the straw, pick it up and then pour it. And what these do is these just give you a little bit more direction of where you're pouring your color. If you're doing a very big pour, you could very easily just pour right out of the cups. So I'll start by taking a little bit of water And I'll put a little bit in each of my colors to get them to activate and a little bit in each of my ramekins. If you are using the dot card, you could put just 
a little tiny drop of water on these six here. And that's just gonna help you mix up your color a lot easier. I'm putting about a tablespoon in each of my ramekins. Our painting's not that big today, so we don't need to mix up too, too much. And I'm gonna start with some Hansa Yellow Light. Hansa Yellow Light is a light in value color, right? It has a lighter value than the other colors. But don't let that fool you. This Hansa Yellow Light is kind of pushy. It's kind of a bossy color. So when I'm doing forest scenes, you can splatter some of this into your dark greens and it will push and kind of leave itself in the midst of all the heavier greens. If this is your first time using Thalos, these are super dominant, high, high, high mixing strength. So when I say to mix any of these colors together, if you're using these, the Thalo colors, remember a little tiny bit is all you need. So I'm going to mix up also my pink color. So I'm going to take a little bit of the quinacridone red and a little bit of the quinacridone magenta. And that will be my, my pretty and pink color to get started. I'm going to go ahead and do a slight light swatch. You're also going to want to have some toilet paper on hand. So you want the yellow to be mixed up enough to where it almost looks like a cadmium when you put it on the paper. And my other color that I'm going to start with is the Hansa Yellow Light. And remember, just a little tiny bit of the Thalo Turquoise. So watch how this shifts. See, it's just plain yellow right now. And I literally just put the tip of my brush in there. Look at that, Mountain Dew. <laughs> but see how light it is? It almost looks like tea, like watered down tea. That means we need more pigment. So I'm gonna put a little more of the Thalo Turquoise and a lot more of the hands of yellow light. Just want to get a nice starter green. Yeah, that's really pretty. So imagine the color of Mountain Dew. One other color that I forgot to mention that we'll be using today on my dot card is the sepia. It's also semi-transparent. I don't need that one quite yet, but I did forget to mention it. So I think I'll mix it up now. And that way, once we're painting, we can kind of move from section to section. Now you want the sepia to be a nice dark mix. You don't need to have too, too much of it. So you wanna have it very saturated, meaning that you've put a lot of pigment into the water. But you don't need to have, you know, cups and cups of it, just a few tablespoons. When I start painting, it's going to be fluid. I tend to paint in a flow, meaning I'll move from part to part. So all of this prep works helps me to be able to do that. With watercolor pouring or painting wet on wet techniques, we are constantly working in a way, trying to beat the clock of working before our paint dries, or our water dries on the paper. So having some of this prepared early on will help us to have that loose, atmospheric, blendy, blendy. <laughs> painting that watercolor pouring and painting a lot of water produces.
Does anybody have any questions for me so far before we get started? If you want to ask, me. yes. Yeah, so which color did you use for the green? I used the Hansa yellow light mm -hmm. and then a tiny, tiny bit of the Thalo turquoise. Okay, thank you. Yes, so I'm gonna go ahead and repeat the colors. The yellow is the Hansa yellow light. Any Hansa yellow will do or a lemon yellow if you don't have the dot card today. My pink color is a mix of the quinacridone red and quinacridone magenta. You might notice it kind of looks like that opera pink color, doesn't it? Or quinacridone rose, beautiful bright pink. This Mountain Dew green color is the Hansa yellow light with a touch of phthalo turquoise. And then this beautiful brown is pure sepia. Sepia is a cool color. It really reminds me of like mushroom coffee color and it has its very own granulation pattern. So if you are ever painting and you wash this out with a lot of water, it almost looks like little pepper settling down onto the texture of your paper. I absolutely love it. I doubt we'll be able to see it yet, but can you guys see some of that granulation happening on the sepia? Isn't that pretty? That's cool. Is there a different red you could use from Daniel Smith? Yeah, you could use any of the quinacridone colors. So the quinacridone rose, the, the lilac. Um, you could probably use the pyrrole red and just water it down or add a touch of blue to get it to more of the pink color. I'm gonna leave these right here. So that way, if you see me going to mix a color, you'll know which one I'm mixing from. Again, that's Hansa Yellow Light, Quinacridone Sienna, Quinacridone Red, Quinacridone Magenta, Thalo Turquoise, and Thalo Blue Red Shade. And you want your colors to be nice and bold. Don't worry, watercolor has a way of muting as it dries. So it's a, it's a little bit in your face at first, it's just right. Remember, we can always neutralize our colors, but it's very, very hard to get the bright, shiny, you know, popular, trendy, bold colors. So we can always tone it down. <laughs> so starting off a little bright is always exciting. Gonna start off slow and then we're going to move on. So we're going to kind of start from the center and move out as we go. Remember how we said we didn't necessarily put in all of our pencil marks on our petals? I'm going to just pick a couple. And you'll notice that in my practice painting, I'm a little off script. So I did a little bit of design on it. And that's what I'm going to try and mimic. So I'm just going to put one petal here, do one. I'm doing it very, very light, maybe one here. And then the rest of these, I can just kind of. Just kind of put in a couple little lines where these are, just to kind of remind myself where overlap is. Really, really light. So by doing it almost barely there, then I will get to keep some of this beautiful white. One more thing, a lot of people don't realize that white is a color <laughs> or a value, I should say, to use when you're painting. So when you're painting, think of having your white as one color and then usually two to three values so imagine if white i'll use the sepia to demonstrate so imagine white is one color 
Then you have your lightest value. Then you have a medium value. And then you'll have your darkest value. This, there's so many different levels of value. This is kind of based on your preference, but always think of the white as being one of your values. And because that's something we have in watercolor that is unique to our medium is that we actually get to use the white of the paper. And the more you use the white of your paper and your paintings, I just think the more alive your painting becomes. They say that color sells the painting, but value is what gets the person to walk across the room and look at it. So we'll be working on both of those today. You wanna make sure you have, after you've mixed all your colors that your brush is clean. Never fails, I'll be painting a section where it's gonna be a very, very light value and that phthalo blue or turquoise will creep up on my brush and stain it in a way. A question in the chat is if I have a kit and unfortunately I don't have a kit as of yet. So you can buy the tubes individually and that's why I just am so thankful to Daniel Smith for putting these dot cards together because you kind of get to try it before you buy it. And they gave us these extra large dots today. So thank you, thank you. So to get started, I'm gonna tuck a little bit of this yellow in now and just get started on that. So I'm just gonna take some of this yellow. If I find it's a little bit too muted, I can take some right off my palette. I'm just gonna put a little bit in around my main petals. And I like to connect shapes. So sometimes I'll pull it down, even if the reference photo doesn't necessarily justify that, and I'll just bring it down. I've now gotten my brush with water. I've taken the paint off of it, and I have just water on my brush now and I can blend it just the tiniest bit, give it a little bit of room to blend. And that little bit of yellow is gonna be glowing. Give us a little tiny bit of glow on our flower. I want just the slightest bit of a shadow color. So for my shadow color, I'm gonna mix the tiniest, I mean, the most micro dot, of the thalo blue red shade. See, it's the tiniest bit. If you know how to use the chat, I would love to hear where you're all painting from today. I'm painting from Southern California. We were joking before the meeting about how People from California talk fast. <laughs> so if you need me to slow down, just put in the chat to slow and that will help me to stay mindful of that. So I really, really watered down. Barely there, phthalo blue. This is the phthalo blue red shade. And I wanna show you a trick for making the most pretty gray is to take a tiny bit of the quinacridone sienna. Oh, I'm getting that. that. Plastic just came off of the brush. One second. So I mixed just a little bit of the quinacridone sienna. See how that grayed it down, toned it just a hair. I'm gonna put one more little dot of the quinacridone sienna. Just want kind of an earthly, earthy, kind of toned down blue. We have, hello, Virginia, <laughs> Missouri, Virginia, Maryland, LA, <laughs> wonderful, exciting. Washington, DC, whoo. <laughs> Wow, keep keep typing them in guys. I, I love, it makes me so happy that 
through these Zoom and online events, we can connect from all over the world. Nashville, Tennessee, <laughs> Springville, Virginia, New Mexico, Kentucky, Ruckersville. Oh, that sounds like a fun town. Hi, Reba. <laughs> Arkansas. We have more folks from Southern California, Maryland. Oh, my goodness. Is anybody out of our country? Is anybody outside of the United States? Cincinnati, Baltimore, Towson, Annapolis, all from Maryland. Wow. North Carolina, we got some East Coast friends today. I'm gonna take the tiniest bit. I'm gonna keep checking back on that chat, but I'm gonna take the tiniest bit of this kind of muted color. Now, the, the thing a lot of people do is they load up their brush and then they slap it on their paper. But you just wanna load your brush, make sure that you're just getting a little tiny bit and, and taking the excess off. And I'm just gonna put the tiniest bit and if it touches the yellow and runs up into the yellow a little bit, I'm okay. But by putting these shadows down now, when I get to my pouring part of the painting, I don't have to worry about them as much. So just put these down now, kind of get them out of the way. Buffy, what color did you mix with the blue? Quinacridone sienna, so an orange. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, thank you for helping with questions. I then take my wet brush and I can touch it and blend it a little bit. I find the trick to having good watercolor shadows is to have some that are hard lined and some that you've blended. So I just go back and forth between the two. Like this petal has a little bit of shadow up at its top. And so does this one, excess off. Another thing is these synthetic, since they're synthetic, but they're trying to mimic animal hair brushes, natural hair brushes hold a lot of water. So sometimes you have to get your brush wet and then kind of dab it, and then you can blend it. So that way you're not leaving a big puddle on your paper. So see how I just put the color on and then just with the water, I can blend it ever so softly. I put the color down. I'm thinking about where is behind. So I'm looking for areas where maybe the petal is behind something. In the chat box, Nancy asked, is it possible to share the reference photo? I'm having trouble determining where the photos are. So I'm gonna set this right here for now why we do this and if possible maybe someone can add it to the chat box i don't know if one thing about my style of painting though is that i am a little hmm, i don't know the right word for it maybe reba can help me because she's taken my classes before um mm -hmm. a little bit stylized <laughs> Yeah, stylized meaning that I go off script quite a bit so sometimes I'll look at it and just think to myself well that section needs a shadow or I don't need that much of a shadow so sometimes I just kind of feel <laughs> I think you're in, I think you're intuitive intuitive hi Reba yes hello intuitive. <laughs> an intuitive painter is a good word for it and there are uh, there are a few of us out there. There, I I like to say there's the engineers, and they're very um, direct painters. They paint exactly what they see, and then there's you know the free spirited artists. So just like our personalities are different, our painting styles can be very different too. And I don't think there is right or wrong. I think there is just that personalities. We all see color different. We all have a, like almost like being on a spectrum, meaning that we each have our own level of realism that we want in our paintings. Some people are completely abstract painters, which is 
very expressive, very, very loose. Yeah, Nancy, um, if, if you're doing the sketch, I say just put a couple. I just put that one right there. So one little teardrop, one right here and one right there versus how many there actually are. And, and that's just a style decision to simplify it. And the recording will be available on YouTube probably by tomorrow on Plaza Arts YouTube channel. So exciting. One last little spot, oops, sorry, forgot to leave that there, is I can put just a little tiny bit of the shadow color on the stem because that's gonna be down in the shadow. And I can pull that all the way down. And just let that sit there. Maybe blend it right there. Now that's my first step on my flower. But I do, while it's wet, since I'm a wet painter, is I do want to introduce just a little touch of pink. I know that there's hardly any pink on our photo reference. But if you look, there's this little line right there. There's a little bit of pink here. There's a little bounce back of pink. And you'll notice in our bud, there's some pink. So you can be as expressive and stylized as you want. Did you know that water lilies, which is what this one is, and you can tell water lily from a lotus because a lotus has very matte, rounded, kind of barrel shaped, petals that are thin and papery and a water lily has these star pointy flower shapes and they're a little more waxy and shiny. One other way you can tell them apart is a lotus have solid lily pads whereas the lotus can have variegated lily pads which is a lot of fun to paint and lastly you can stylize your color a little bit because the water lily Unlike the lotus that only comes in white, red, and pink, the water lily, it comes in blue, purple, yellow, red, peach, white, and pink. So if something gets wet and pink goes shooting up your flower, no problem. It's a pink water lily. <laughs> so I'm just going to take a little tiny bit, set this right here so you can see it, of this pretty and pink color. Remember how strong it is? So I don't need a whole, whole lot. So I can just load up the tip of my brush and I can choose a couple little spots to just introduce that color. And because I already know that these colors get along, if one color touches the other, I don't get too worked up about it because I know they'll blend into some kind of a pretty neutral. Sometimes prettier than I could do it if I intended to do it. So I think that color mixing is a lot different when we're thinking about watercolor. When we're mixing other mediums, you can add colors like white and black in a way that you can come up with endless colors. With watercolor, it's not always as straightforward as yellow and blue make green because is it a warm yellow? Is it granulating? There's all these other rules, right? To So having a palette of colors that, that blend well together is part of, it's part of the battle right there. So just having that little bit of pink right there in the center, that's enough for me for right now, just to have that flower started. Ooh, I had a little bit of pink left over on my brush. So maybe I'll just tie that in to some of my shadow colors. So when you take a class with a professional watercolor artist or someone who's somewhat established, it's kind of nice because oftentimes they've kind of done that math for us. They've kind of figured out what colors get along on a palette. So when you see those sets where it's 
so-and-so's set of paints. It's always so wonderful because you can trust that those colors are gonna get along somewhat. One other place, because I like to connect, is I'm gonna take a little bit of pink and a little bit stronger, and I'm gonna pull it right down that stem. How exciting. We have a question in the chat that is important for anybody who joined us later is that how do I get the outline on my paper? Do I try to draw it? I highly recommend drawing when you have time. But if you don't have time, you can go ahead and take some pencil and go over the lines on the back of your paper, set it down, and you can trace it right onto your paper. And that's how you can get that. Okay, so we got our flower done in a traditional, you're welcome. We got our flower done in a traditional fashion. <laughs> and that way, if nothing else, we have a flower today, right? <laughs> so now that we've painted probably in a way that you've seen before or you've tried before, let's get crazy. Let's have, have let's put our hair down and have some fun. I like to tell all my attending artists to think of this as a practice painting. If you get a finished painting that's beautiful and that you're happy with, that's awesome. But if it doesn't turn out like mine, some of these colors, it might be the first time you've tried them, some of these techniques. So give, we always got to give ourselves a time to learn and to practice. And that is what these workshops and demos are perfect for. So I'm going to start with my darkest value now. So I painted my light value. Now I wanna get my dark value started. I'm gonna go ahead and get the areas wet where I see this sepia color or black color. These angle shader brushes are awesome for this because you can go and carve right up to the line of what you're, you're painting. So basically we're getting the areas wet and this could be tricky because you might accidentally paint over a lily pad, that's okay. Try and not <laughs> paint over all your lily pads. <laughs> Speaking from experience, I'm sure. Um, but try and wet the areas that are dark and leave your lily pads bone dry. You know, I didn't ask, is this the cold press arches paper, Tara? It that is. Makes sense simple? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Another thing a lot of people don't realize is that when you're using professional gate grade paper like this, the arches or any of the other ones, um, they're made of a hundred percent cotton paper. So those that staining quality I was talking about early on. It really stains the paper just like a, a dye would, a fabric. And you can use both sides of the paper a lot of times. So if this painting is a practice painting and you're gonna do another one, you could just wait till it's completely dry and flip it over and try painting on the other side. Another thing is some people get really frustrated with their artwork, how sad, and they throw their paintings away. And that's, I don't recommend doing that. Always give cool a cool off period. Put those paintings that you're not happy with in a drawer and step away, walk away, give it a couple weeks and then take another look at it. And if you still think, oh, this painting is, that's it. I'm unhappy with it. You could always do what I do and, and I will cut it into strips and make bookmarks out of them or turn them over and use the backside for color swatching. Just getting a couple of these areas wet. If you've gone over a couple of your lily pads, not to worry because maybe those ones are kind of under the water a little bit. In the tighter area, you might need to get 
your brown brush and get that water to go up. I still have some pink on my brush. <laughs> Would we see the reference photo, please? They also put the reference photo into the chat box. So you can, let's see, I'm gonna try. If I right click it. You should be I, able to do that, Buffy, yeah. Yeah, so if I, if I go to, if you're on your computer, I apologize if you're on an iPad, but if you're on your computer, you can go to the chat box. You can go to the reference photo, right click, and you can do open file, and then you can print a copy off. And remember, this video will be uh, recorded, so you'll be able to watch the replay and try this again if, if you need to go slower, for instance. Some people like to pause and rewind and catch up. So I drop a little bit more water in, and I'm going to hold this up just a hair so you can see where... Now I'm going to take my pipette and I'm Buffy, going to... Buffy, yes. excuse me, before you do that, at the bottom of the reference photo, there's a reflection. Do we wet that now or wait? That's a good question, Reba. So if you consider yourself to be like beginner, intermediate, or above, you could do basically the part that's dark and leave that dry. But if you're a beginner, I would just do this whole area dark. If you are a more experienced watercolor artist, we're gonna pour it, and when it's almost dry, we're gonna scoot right over that with a brush, and you'll just have the slightest suggestion of one. Or I can show you how to lift it at the end. Hmm. You know what, I'm gonna pour the whole thing, and then at the end, if we have time, I can show you how to lift some of those reflections. I think that's a good idea. So now I'm gonna take my pipette or my straw, or I could pour straight from the cup. I wanna make sure my paint is, is mixed up. Cause sometimes when we pre-mix them, it'll get all not mixed as well. So you wanna make sure there's no globs of paint if you're ever putting tube paint in here. And you're going to take and you're going to now begin to pour this color into these wet areas. Since it's water, this is the, the beautiful, dark, deep, dark, muddy waters that these lotus flowers rise from, kind of like the Phoenix story, the rising Phoenix. So these beautiful lilies will live in shallow pond water, only about two to five deep, two to five feet deep. And then they'll rise up out of the bog <laughs> and, and take in the sun and bloom and blossom. So kind of like that quote, grow, grow where you're planted, regardless of where we are in life, to blossom and bloom where we are. The water lily is a perfect representation of that for sure. So notice how I poured it on there and I'm just kind of letting it set up a minute. This is that point where I'm giving it permission to, to seep down into the cotton fibers of the paper. So when you get the cotton paper wet, all those fibers are opening up and getting stained right now. And using my round brush, I can get it dry, make sure there's no alien color on there. And now I can tidy up my lines and go up to and around any areas where my water started to dry. Meanwhile, I'm leaving those other areas to kind of just do what watercolor does. It never fails when I'm painting with watercolor that the areas that I leave and let be and let watercolor be watercolor are often become my favorite parts of a painting. It seems like the parts of a painting that I fuss with 
and I just fiddle, <laughs> fiddle and fiddle and, oh, it just needs this. Oh, it just needs that. Oftentimes those are the overworked kind of muddy areas that I'm not fond of. So. This Buffy, is someone what... wanted to know what color you're using. Oh, sepia. Sepia. Fun fact, I mentioned my YouTube channel before of like 150 videos, a couple years worth of videos. And uh, <laughs> I called sepia sepia for the longest time. <laughs> yes, straight, straight sepia. Be careful of where your lily flower is that you don't go over it. If there's a petal sticking up, for instance, in an area. You can also borrow. So you can pick up some where there's a puddle and you can move it over to an area where maybe you forgot to pour some color. Gosh, I love this Princeton Elite brush. Are you guys enjoying it? Doesn't it have just a yummy little tip on there? Wow, how cool. I've, I have, this is my first event where there was a, a vendor package like this put together and it really, really impressed me. How lovely that you can try the supplies, some of the supplies I use without having to go buy hundreds of dollars worth of supplies <laughs> before the event. When I first started taking watercolor classes myself, I had completely different supplies than the instructor had. And so by the time I tried to get every last thing on her list, because I did not understand the theory of substitution. <laughs> so I didn't substitute anything. I had to get what she had. You know, it was well over a couple hundred dollars. And now I've learned that it really helps, especially if it's a, you haven't decided if you're going to on take ongoing classes this is try and substitute what you have and then try some of the things out and then once you've taken a couple of classes with that person you can really commit and get their supplies but I have to be honest when I say that all the supplies I bought were what brought me to Daniel Smith and I fell in love uh, Daniel Smith has so many colors to match every stinking last mood change I have. Look at that. <laughs> I mean, there's ne I'm never going to run out of colors to try. Now they have the watercolor sticks, which if you haven't tried these yet, they are amazing. Uh, they are a pan in the hand is what they like to call them. And they're super, super pigmented. So if you're ever looking for a Daniel Smith color in the tube, you want to get, you want to try the color, you can get a lot of the sticks for a fraction of the price of the tube. And they're actually more pigmented. They're the same ingredients, but more pigmented than the tube. So you actually, in my opinion, get quite a bit of paint. Tara, does Plaza Art carry the sticks? We don't actually. Uh, we had them at one point uh, many oh. years ago and ended up clearing them out because they didn't sell. But I, you know, I know they're they're gaining in popularity, but any store can get them for for anybody if you're one of our local customers. OK, well, if Plaza was going to only have three, <laughs> I would say the titanium white and the cobalt teal blue, the raw sienna. Oh, let me make it. If you could only have one, I would say the electric the iridescent electric blue. So this one comes in a stick, which is exciting. So see how the areas where I've just let it sit there, guys, see how it's creating those effects of water ripples for me. So if you look at your reference photo, you'll see it's not just pure brown. There's little things happening in there. So I'm just giving the watercolor a chance for those illusions. So speaking of the electric blue, I'm going to show you those three colors that I mentioned at the very start. The bronzite, the kyanite, 
and then the the special color electric blue and I'm just going to drop these into these wet sections to show you the magic that they have. So first I'm going to take the electric blue color. Let me show you what it looks like. And you guys do carry this one, right, Tara? Sorry. Um, yeah, we have every single Daniel Smith color. Okay, so this color. Look at that, that beautiful, bright sky blue. So this, the electric blue watered down, will have hardly any shimmer at all hardly any at all. And you can use this as a substitute for like cerulean blue or cobalt blue, which are granulating and kind of chalky for skies. This makes a vibrant, bright, bold, beautiful sky. And if you use it in a thicker, a thicker fashion, it can be a little bit darker. And that's where you'll see shimmer when this dries. So remind me before we close out and I'll hold this up. So I've loaded some on my brush, full strength, and I can just drop some in. I'm not mad if it gets on my lily pads because that'll just be a little texture. If it gets on my lily flower, I'll just do one of those real quick. And I don't know if you can see what it's doing, but it's spreading out and adding a little bit of magic. So that was the bronze, or I'm sorry, the electric blue. Now I'm gonna do the bronzeite color. Bronzeite is another one where when it's full strength, it's one color, but watered down, look at that. And the bronzeite is both granulating as well as sparkly. <laughs> so it mimics sand perfectly. So any of you ocean artists, and then the same thing, you can drop it into a couple spots that are wet. And it just does, it adds that little special something, especially for areas of water like this. It, it spreads out, it bleeds and blends in a way that gives your painting a lot of character. And the last color, the kyanite. See how dark of value it is in full strength. Buffy, then, what can they use? What different blue can they use if they don't have the electric blue? If you don't have the electric blue, I would just use, um, you know what you could do is you can take these two, your Thalo blue red shade and your Thalo turquoise, and we're gonna make a mock of it. So do like a 50-50 of the two colors. And I'm going to just touch this in. Now it's going to be a little bit stronger. See how much stronger it is? A little bit pushier than the other colors. But because it's super staining and a very dominant, it'll be it'll be pushy too. Pushy enough. And when it dries, it's going to dry a little bit lighter and it'll draw it'll dry quite close to the color we have. I'm gonna swatch it next to it so you can see. It's pretty close. But it has more of a dry shift or you can water it down. Oh, I just got paint all over me. <laughs> you can water it down and get a very similar color. The only difference between this mock color and the actual color would be that it's not going to have the sparkle. And the um, electric blue just has this vibrancy that is unique to it, meaning that it doesn't have too much of a dry shift. A dry shift is when you paint it on wet, it has one value. And then when it completely dries, it has a whole nother. But so this is our mock color, and this is our electric iridescent electric blue i'm really impressed with how you pulled that out like just like <laughs> first try first attempt um it's very <laughs> similar um and just to clarify mary's asking what was dropped after bronzite that was that mixture create the bomb. that was the kyanite and kyanite, kyanite. okay 
Hyanite looks like a Payne's gray, like a Payne's blue gray color. But then when you water it out, it makes this almost like an overcast day gray, which I love for skies as well. So sunny day, I'll go with this pretty sky blue, stormy, moody day. I'll go with this beautiful kyanite color. And it has a little shimmer too. So when you drop that color in, it also has a cushy effect. Typically with watercolor pouring, you'll see the person, and I do it a lot too, is do this kind of rocking to and fro. Um, if you're pouring more than one color and you keep rocking it and rocking it, meaning that you're, you're moving the paper to get the paint to move around, be careful because eventually all your poured colors are going to mix into one neutral, right? So if I put yellow and blue in here and stirred it up, it would make a green, right? So if I pour yellow and blue on here and I want the colors to have those cool blendy effects, Sometimes it's nice to let them set up a bit first before you move it around. Or you can not run the paint off the sides and instead you can just barely lean it and take the paint to the tape line and take a little tissue and get those puddles up. If we leave the puddles indefinitely, what will happen is it'll create those blossoms and blooms. So depending on your subject, you might not mind some blossoms and blooms. But if this is your first time pouring, don't recommend them, except for the ones we did intentionally, which by leaving it on the paper as long as we did, we definitely allowed some of that to happen. And now we go in and just get that excess paint Pick it up with the tissue. You have an isolated area where there is a puddle, like say right there. You can also take just the corner of your, just the corner of your tissue paper and just sop it right up. So this is, this next step is scary for some people. And it's something kind of new I've been working on in 2023. And I nicknamed it Borrowing Shadows. So our lily pads aren't completely flat, right? They are, they are curving and they have little um, areas. Like right here, if you look at the reference photo, there's actually water collecting there. So that means that this is a little indent. So sometimes we can get the idea of that by working with shadows. So what I'll do is before my background is completely dry and some of your background may already have dried, I'm gonna look for a couple places to pull. See that? I have a wet brush and I'm gonna go up. I'm gonna touch an area where the background's still wet. I'm gonna pull in some shadows onto my lily pad and this is also going to prep it and start getting these wet for our next pour which will be some exciting green. Buffy did you use white artist tape on your edge? No I'll, I'll tell you guys a hack if it's okay. like a, an 11 by 14 or smaller I use scotch tape just plain old scotch tape and I'll tape my border and I usually go a quarter inch over the side. Oh, and now I, I see it. It looked before like it was wrapped around the edges because I couldn't see the edge of the tape. Aha. Oh, yeah. Yep. It's just good old scotch tape. To be honest, I've even done it like up to like a 12 by 16. And only because sometimes artist tape, uh, I use this one called Pro Artist Tape off of Amazon. But it can get kind of expensive if you're painting often, if you're really getting into like daily painting. Really quick, here are those two colors dried. So see how this one dried a little bit lighter? The more, if you create your palette and a lot of my attending artists for my workshops, they'll use my colors or they'll create their own. Maybe they have another color that they like better than mine. But by having a core palette, the more you study and the more you paint, the more you're gonna know what those colors can and can't do. 
and you'll be able to mix up your colors with a lot less um, fearless, like you could be very fearless. So I forgot to borrow all my shadows because I got off on talking about this or that. So I'm gonna go and try and borrow just a couple more. This also ties, what I like about this borrowing shadow technique is oftentimes it'll tie that background color into the whole painting. So that way it's not like the sepia is only in the background. It ties it all together. I've been really big into this lately is this connecting shapes, connecting colors, connecting values. Just something, it's like a conversation I'm having with my paper and my paint. Just pulling some of those colors in. In a few places, getting some areas wet, being mindful of where my flowers are. I'm getting most of my petals wet at this point. My sorry, my lily pads wet. See how we're doing good on time too. Okay, we're doing great, guys. Let me get. I I just a follow up to the tape. You mentioned a size limitation. Can you explain why that matters? Yeah. So the Scotch tape is not created for this purpose. It is, you know, scotch tape. It's it's just not, it's not artist grade tape. But with this size painting, I found that it holds my paper flat and it, it keeps its bond. But the bigger the paper, the more the buckle often. And with the higher paper, you get a little bit more of a buckle and the, it's not strong enough to hold it. So if I go like 11 by 14, or higher, that is my mascot. <laughs> if I go 11 by 14 or higher, then um, the scotch tape won't hold. And that's when I'll switch to an actual art tape to tape down my paper. Makes sense, thank you. You're welcome. Sometimes I stretch my paper too if I'm doing a really big painting. But, so now that I've got my, lily pads somewhat wet and I pulled my background color onto my lily pads which has just toned it down a bit. Now I can start to introduce my lily pad colors and if this color runs into my water I'm okay-ish with it <laughs> because a lot of this has set up. And I can do one final layer when this is dry at the end. So I'm gonna introduce this beautiful Mountain Dew color just so I can start to get a fill for where my water is and to have that, that color kind of echo down into the whole story. This is where I can take the color and I can go right up to the edge if I want. I don't want any to run off and leave that edge white. Like right here, some pulled up into my, my sepia color, but it's okay. I'm, I'm not mad at that. I'm gonna let it, I'm gonna let it. Another thing about painting in this way is that sometimes you're going to learn some color theory without even trying or color mixing because <laughs> the colors will mix in a way and you'll look down and you'll say, oh my gosh, where did that color come from? I remember I was pouring a Rossi in a color. It's Rossi in a light. It's on my, um, my dot card, by the way. It's my favorite earthy yellow. And I had poured some magenta nearby and the two met up in the middle and it made the perfect uh, sand, bronze, bronze sand color. And now that is my go-to mix is the quinacridone magenta, just the tiniest bit with the raw sienna light. And it just makes this go-to color that I use in my, my nature paintings. So see how I'm using my angle shader brush to carve into 
the areas that are round. So basically I'm carving in around the flower now. And I don't mind if I'm getting blooms on my lily pads. It's kind of hard to see right now, but I don't mind that at all because these lily pads are full of texture. Different colors too. We could see some blues, some deeper greens. So once I have my base color, I can put, let's put a little bit of phthalo turquoise in there and deepen it to that God awful grass green, right? <laughs> let's put a little bit of grass green. The secret to painting with grass green, and this is my color opinion. We all see color different and some colors to some are absolutely beautiful and to other, they can be a bane in their existence. And grass green was one of mine. I, when I was painting, oops, sorry, I put a little bit of yellow too. I would try and just use green right out of the tube because I didn't know that you could mix, you know, I hadn't learned mixing yet. And so the secret with grass green is to give it other colors besides the grass green. You can use grass green, it's a beautiful color, but give other colors with it. And then, then you'll learn to appreciate it if it's been bugging you. So now I've added that grass green. So the first color was the Mountain Dew Green, which was the Hansa Yellow Light. And the uh, tiniest bit of phthalo turquoise. Then for the grass green, I've added a little bit more turquoise. Not being too picky about it, just putting it in and letting it do its thing, letting it do those beautiful blends. Now I can play with my colors a little bit. What would happen if I took a little bit of the phthalo blue red shade and made a deeper color? What if I started to look at my reference and pick a couple spots to put a darker color here and there. Maybe I can get the look of this lily pad by just dragging this darker color up and off. See those little direction lines starting? Maybe I'll even do a little circle in them. So it's going to blend and fade. And what about this guy? This guy is kind of going this way. Because it's wet, I can put these on there and they're gonna kind of blend out and do their thing. Just They say repetition, Tony Couch, repetition with alternation and variation. So what that means is that I have repetition of the same colors in my painting but I'm alternating them and varying them and where they're, they're at on the paper. And that way, it's not just a solid Mountain Dew background. These leaves are getting some personality, or lily pads, sorry, they're getting some personality. What if we took some more of this phthalo blue red shade and shifted this to a bit more of a blue color. Just keep looking for some spots. To have some nice color changes. What if I wanted kind here to have more of a blue? Buffy, uh, Debbie's wondering, won't this produce blooms in the paint or is that okay with you? I don't mind the blooms because these have 
little nuances on them anyways. So I'm kind of hoping that this will create the texture for me and create some, basically to, some illusions of the lily pads having some movement. At the very end, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to try and soften anything or or do a little bit of direct painting. But right now I'm working in this wet on wet fashion. So if you're painting wet on wet, a good thing to think of is that you are going to have blooms and blossoms, at least when you're first starting out painting this way. And then as you get more experience, you might be able to overcome that, but um, kind of accepting it in the beginning is nice. So see how I deepened right there? I'm gonna deepen right here too just to kind of make the, the flower pop up a little bit. And this lily pad is behind this one. Have most of you painted wet on wet before? Because it is something that can be a little discouraging at first, but once you start to play with it, you can get a feel for when you can, how much time you can play. For instance, each of us, some of you are on the East Coast, I'm in a very arid desert region. So some areas you're gonna have more dry time than other areas. Or if you're ever painting outdoors, you, you know, oh my goodness, you have to work fast because it's drying so quickly. So this is one of those things that we're having the mentality that we're practicing is a really good one to keep. So right now I'm, I'm okay with my greens and due to time, I'm going to get over to my round brush and I'm going to introduce the variegation of these leaves. If you're like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that's, that's too much. I want to keep my, my lily pads green, not to worry, but I'm going to go ahead and load my brush up with that pretty and pink color. And I'm going to use this now and I'm going to start just the teeniest bit, right? Less at first. So I want to get a feel for how wet each lily pad is. So the lily pads might be wetter in some areas or drier too, depending on where you last worked. So just that little bit on the tip of my brush, see how I'm wiping it off on the edge? This is my pink color. The pink color is the quinacridone red with a little bit of quinacridone magenta. And if you think about your color wheel, right? These are on opposite sides. So that means it's a complement color. So not only will it neutralize the color it's added to, but it can also um, accent the color. So if you take a complement color, the opposites on the color wheel, then they will enhance each other, meaning one, when they're next to each other, the green's gonna pop a little bit more if it's next to like oranges and reds and purples and vice versa. And if you mix them on paper, you get a neutral. See how it took that pink and made it into this like off pink? So we're just gonna put a little bit in it now. And then at that final step, I can put pure pink down. But this is also helping me tell the story of having that alternation and variation and having a little bit of that color in the background of these lily pads. And again, because I'm using colors that get along, uh, you will have the mixes often won't be that bad. The mixes that they make, like that's a cool color. It's almost like a peachy color. So this will just be my starter to get the suggestion of some other colors besides the green and the blue. Now, I'm gonna let this set up a minute what I mean by setting up is that the longer it sits on the paper wet, the more it's going to blend out. Let's say you have a pattern like mine that's kind of looking like a spider and you don't want it to blend out anymore. 
you can take a dryer and you can dry that part really quick and that'll stop the spread. Like right here, I have a puddle. So I can just take my tissue and go along my tape line and pull those puddles up now. So that way I can get to our finishing touches, which will be to anchor all this. Um, finishing touches, I'll usually do like 90% of my painting this way, kind of a painting pouring method. And then my final touches is when I've allowed the watercolor to be kind of wild. I've let the kids go outside to play, right? We've let the watercolors go on the paper and play. We've let them have their time. And now is when I'm going to come in and tone things down or tighten things up or adjust values and just be a little more intentional. Like right now I have this bloom happening. Guess what that could be? That could be a lily pad that's kind of tucked under the water a little bit. If you don't have a dryer, you can use a fan or you can do what I do is I'll go set it on the front porch for like 10 minutes <laughs> since I live in the desert and it'll be dry. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, you know, I'm going to let it, I'm going to let it spread a little bit more. And now I'm going to start to work on these finishing touches because we have about 30 minutes left. So I'm going to take some pure sepia at this point. Um, We've got some questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, so... I'm going to answer questions as I paint, just so we stay on, on we're not tardy for this party. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So Anna's asking, I missed the beginning. How do you use the pipette or straw? So the pipette or the straw, I use it just to have more controlled pours. So when I'm wanting to pour into an area, especially on smaller paintings, I'll, I'll use this to suck the paint up. Let's see, I can suck paint up and then I can pour it onto my painting in a tighter area. If it was a straw, I would put the straw in the paint, put my finger over the top, move it over, and then take your finger off and it'll come flowing out of the straw. Awesome. So I'm gonna deepen my lily pads in a couple spots. And if I had an area where a new lily pad popped up, I'm going to run with that. And I'm going to let it be part of the painting. See that? We just got a lily pad that's behind one. Isn't that cool? Very. Um, yeah. Debbie would also like to know when you dry parts, do you shield or mask any of the other parts so they don't dry? Yeah, I, with this dryer, it's called a heated craft tool by Ranger. So it's very low flow. So it doesn't push the paint. So see, I can have it this close and it's not pushing the paint across the paper like a blow dryer would. So since it has such a low flow, I could sit here like this while I'm painting over here and uh, not worry about it drying the other areas as much. So I snuck in another lily pad there. <laughs> Spin these guys out. There we go. So now I've got my value deepened on that section of the water. See how that just kind of tightened it in a bit? So we've had all this kind of free flow happening. Uh, Reba asked what we're going to do with this flower. And since my area down here dried quite light, I'm going to go ahead and deepen this area around it. It's just
just to mimic it, mimic a shape, mimic that there's something else going on there besides just flat water. I'm gonna let that set for a second and I'm gonna move up here really quick. And I see that up here, I have a lily pad kind of coming up that way. So I, but I also have a bloom there. So I can choose to have that be there. Maybe I'll move him that way. Let's get it just a little bit more. Can't believe how fast our workshop went. That's okay. We've got time. I'm just going to anchor. How many of you have tried watercolor pouring before? And have you ever seen it done in this way compared to the traditional watercolor pouring, which is they mask, they would mask the whole flower, for instance, or the very lightest areas with masking fluid, let that dry, then they'll pour the paint, <laughs> and then they'll mask their next layer. So for me, I, I started off trying to paint that way, and I had a really hard time um, painting the masking fluid. So it, it seemed a little tedious for me. And uh, so I started to paint around the areas and leaving the areas dry instead of masking them. And uh, I really, it's kind of become a hybrid way of pouring. Let's see. Cherie said, I just did your terracotta class, waiting for my stencils today to finish it up. Oh, awesome. Thank you for taking both of my online classes this month. That's so cool. And Nancy says, have never poured forever. So this was totally new. Yay. <laughs> so if you're completely new to watercolor pouring, uh, a video, videos that are really popular on my thing are how to do the backgrounds, how to pour your backgrounds. So sometimes, even if you're a realistic painter, being able to pour your background to get those loose, flowy backgrounds, it's really a great thing to learn. Another thing that's really popular for pouring is if you do landscapes, so just pour your sky. Get your sky wet, pour some color, rock that board a couple times, let it be, let it dry, and all the troubles you've ever had trying to figure out how to make clouds in the sky, <laughs> well, you've just allowed the watercolors to pour the sky for you. Super exciting. So remember this area where I was introducing a little bit of a reflection? Wouldn't the reflection have some of that color too? So I'm going to put a little bit of that pink down there, and I'm going to take a little bit of yellow, and I'm going to let that set up a little bit longer. And I'm going to switch to my round brush and I'm going to take a little bit of this pink and purple color and I'm gonna deepen my value on my flower just a little bit, just in the tiniest places. Um, I like to have echoes in my painting. So just how I carry color throughout my painting I like to carry the value. So since I darken my value in my background, my muddy, boggy waters, I'm going to mimic that on my flower just ever the slightest bit. Excuse my stuffy nose if it's coming up on the audio. I, uh, it's pollen season, fall pollen season. <laughs> as if spring wasn't hard enough. Let me know if you don't have a fall pollen season in the chat and I will come and visit <laughs> for the rest of fall. I can also take a little bit of color. Uh, you know, maybe I'll improvise. Why don't we take a little bit of the phthalo blue red shade. I mixed it with my sepia color. And I'm just going to introduce it in a couple places in my background to have that continuation of color. 
Maybe I'll just have a couple spots where it's really pronounced. And I'm going to take that color now that I have it in a couple spots in my background, and I'm going to put it on my flower. Now, this doesn't really go with the reference photo, but I feel <laughs> that this stem needed a little bit of love. It needed a little bit of something to bring it down. We've got about 12 minutes left. So I'm going to dry this really quick and I'm going to show you how to make the lily pads separate. All the colors used today in this video are on my dot card, except for the single color, which is the iridescent electric blue. So, Buffy, I have a question about that thing in your hand. So, is it an is it really just a heat gun? Because I'm not hearing any airflow. I was like, is there a mute button for this hair dryer? And then when you introduced it, is so is it similar to like a low level heat gun, a low setting on a regular heat gun? Yeah, if you have an embossing, I think they're for right. embossing. Those little they're like sticks, and yep. they have the heat that come out. Those work mm -hmm. too, but those get a little bit hotter than this guy does. Okay, okay, so, that's good so, to know. Okay, um, but but also Zoom will automatically mute dryers for some reason i don't know why. oh really interesting okay yeah cool. so like right now it's on but you can still hear my voice right yeah is it actually making noise on your end yep yep it's making noise but it mutes it automatically in zoom sessions that's a little interesting okay cool So we have about 15 minutes left. This is going to take a couple minutes to dry. And then I'm going to work on finishing uh, steps on it still, just kind of balancing the painting. But this would be a great time if any of you have questions. Uh, Mary shared that she tried pouring after one of my classes, but her paint wasn't pigmented enough. So it came out very light. So that is a very common, um, a common occurrence when you're learning watercolor pouring. And that's why I spent so much time at the beginning kind of sharing how important these are. So having um, your swatch sketchbook or your uh, little scratch pick, like little, I don't know. Sometimes for instance, if you have watercolor paper that you don't, really light, you can cut it into like bookmark strips and use that for making, testing your colors. But let's say you poured this and it's like barely there tea. Did you know that when this is completely dry, you can go ahead and pour over the whole thing again? And you can do it in glazes just like you would in a traditional painting. So a couple things. That I like about this particular tool too is I can set it here like that and while this part's drying I can work down here so I'm going to take a somewhat clean brush you go ahead and I'm just going to go right over this now that it's set up quite a bit and I'm just going to soften it to where it isn't such so hard but more of a just barely there reflection oh now I can dry that part. Let's say you have an area that you have a nasty bloom happening. You can do the same thing. Just take a brush, a wash brush, and you can just go right over it and you can soften an area where there's a bloom happening that you're not happy with. This is such a good thing to learn 
regardless of what kind of painting you're doing, is that you can just soften those blooms to nothing. Isn't that amazing? I wish someone taught me that at the beginning of my art journey because I had so many paintings where I had giant blooms in my background. And if I'd only, so I didn't like them, but if I'd only known that one trick that you can basically erase them. Oh my gosh, Nancy, I just want to hug you. I'm sending you a virtual, and Sherry, <laughs> I'm sending you a virtual hug in the chat box. They reminded me that we had these wonderful stencils and these were from Crafters Workshop. I seriously wish I have an, had another half hour with you guys. So I collect stencils <laughs> in a little binder and I recently found Crafters Workshop and they, uh, we're so kind to donate the stencils that were in your vendor pack today. And a good rule of thumb when you're choosing a stencil is to get botanical, geometric, a kind of pattern, a kind of stencil that you could use for more than one project. So for today, I chose this beautiful specimen one because I thought you could use these and all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of paintings. So you want to have an area that's completely dry. So if your painting is still wet, wait till later to do this step. I'm going to choose really quick. These are awesome too if you have an area of your painting that went to pot and you're not happy with. So if you have an area that's too dark or it got too muddy or you're just not happy with it or if you're like me and you're running out of time and you don't have time to finish all of these beautiful lily pads, you can choose a spot to just stencil instead. So I'm going to put this spiral guy right here over this bloom. If I had the time, I could just paint the shape. Oh, I want to do both. Okay, I'll do this first. <laughs> so I could take this guy and my toothbrush, clean water. my toothbrush. I'm going to dip it in some clean water and have my toilet paper roll where I can kind of blot. So I get it wet and then I blot. I hold my stencil down firmly and I start to lift. Now it's not going to show up if your paint is very, very light. So if the section that you're doing it on, the paint is very, very light, it's going to be a barely there imprint. This works with 100% cotton professional grade paper. If you're using cellulose paper or wood pulp paper or like sketchbook paper, your results will vary. So once you're done doing a nice lift, you can do a blot. I'm gonna dry it so you can see what it looks like dry. And it's going to leave that cool pattern right there. And it just broke up that little bloom area. But let me show you how much more effective it is in a darker area. So let's say I'm going to put this part and I'm going to say those are two little water, two little water areas. Now here, since I use sepia, and sepia is not that staining, it lifts really good. Remember we were talking about at the very beginning how a lot of times your granulating colors lift really well. Look at that. Now I'm going to warn you guys now that stencil lifting is um, been reported to me to be fairly to heavily addicting and that it might cause you to suddenly run out and buy a bunch of stencils. But 
the off put of that, and you know, I'm kind of joking, but I'm not, is that those people <laughs> who have gone and bought a bunch of stencils, none of them came back and said they wish they had it. They all tend to use them. So I'm going to put these up here. What a way to add a little touch of whimsy with this lovely stencil by Crafters Workshop. And for any of you who have seen my YouTube videos, you'll know that I actually got into designing my own stencils. I don't sell them or anything like that, but I started to design my own so that I would have specific ones for paintings in case I wanted to enter them in shows. So I call this stencil lifting. And I absolutely love it. It just adds something extra to, yes. Yeah, so the question is, is if you use a bender stencil in your painting, are there any issues in saying you have an original painting? If you use a bender stencil in your painting, then I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I don't I don't know the rules of it. You would have to, if you're entering it in a show, you'd probably have to reach out to them and they probably wouldn't know it specifically either. So that's why I just, if I'm doing a show painting, I create my own stencils. And I have a video that kind of shares how I do that. Um, you can buy the stencil material and draw on it with a Sharpie and cut it out with little baby scissors. I use... I invested in a cry cut machine or cricket machine and started to make my own. But see how all of a sudden I had so much work to do on this painting. And then all of a sudden I add a couple stencils. And now there's areas where I, I don't necessarily have to. <laughs> I, I might just leave it. I'm going to do the same one that I started here, but I'm going to put a little echo of it up here. I recently did judge a event that had over 1,700, I was one of the award judges and they, we had over 1,700 entries and I saw one or two paintings that had stencil lifting. So it's just not really that common. I would say if you use the stencil and it made up the majority of your painting, I wouldn't be entering it. But if you notice, I kind of cut mine into pieces and I'm not... The painting isn't about this shape, right? This is just giving it little accents. So if you're using a bender stencil just to be safe, I would just use it in a little itty bit. Final touches, guys. This would be, remember that spectrum I mentioned earlier about where is your level of realism? Now that you've poured and played and let watercolor sing and dance across your paper, you can go in and make those final touches. So I had some blue mixed up. And I know that we're at time. So I'm just going to put in like one or two little pops to show you how you can just do one little trail of color and blend it out. And look at now that is in front of that one. And you can, I'm just using blue to suggest this part. I can do the same thing. With this one, just put a little line in and blend it and boom, now that one is behind the other. See that? Just that little tiny bit of blue gave us a separation. Uh, one other color that I highly recommend while you're finishing up your painting, like for instance, I could put a little blue in the background of that one tone that one down. Um, another color that plays well with these colors is to mix up a little purple. So if you wanted to add a little purple in your painting, see how pretty just that touch of blue, how it really can change the story and, and break things up a little bit, break up some shades. I would love, love, love to see your finished paintings. I know we're gonna hold them up at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and just get mine to where it's not leaking. 
Uh, one last thing, uh, like Reba said, being intuitive, I feel like this needs a little bit of a cast of blue. So I'm just gonna put a little cast of blue there. And maybe I'll just put a little bit there too, just to have a little breakup in that brown. So it's not all just completely brown. I was thinking, Buffy, and I was wondering if instead of, uh, you know, if you use stencil lifting in your work, did those pieces that came in list themselves as watercolor or mixed media? Because I wonder uh, if that would cover you. It's just a thought, but. Well, if you, yeah, if you were, you know, I don't, like I said, I haven't found a rule about it anywhere. <laughs> so the way I get around it is I only do a very little tiny bit of the stencil lifting. I mean, there have been paintings where I've done the majority of it, but typically a mixed media is what's on the paper. And since the stencil lifting isn't what's on That's the paper, true. Yeah. it's just a, a lift, then I just, I use my own stencils to be safe that I'm not infringing on anybody's copyright. And that's about it. I'll enter them, but I won't enter them if it's someone else's stencil. Makes sense. Yeah. One other thing is, remember, I had talked about the pink, since we have the pink there. You can do a couple little, little dots and do a quick blend on some of them. And that will give you that illusion of those uh, variegation and kind of carry that peak down. I wish I had more time to keep making progress on this painting, but I hope that you guys got the gist of the techniques and the colors and the style of painting I do. Um, the original practice painting. I think there's like four or five different lily and lotus flower videos on my YouTube. If any of you want to go in and see the different ways I've tried to tackle this tricky, <laughs> tricky subject. Really quick, I'm going to pull this off of the board. Let's see. Can we go over five minutes, Tara, or do we have to clock out? No, that's fine. Okay, I'm going to dry this real quick to take the tape off to show you guys the finished painting. I'm going to set this right here if any of you want to take down my contact information to keep in touch with me. And here is the hashtag for Plaza Art. They really love it when you share your work just like I do. And um, one other thing is when you try something new for the first time, I so recommend doing one or two studies of it before you really decide if you like it or you don't, because when we try something just the very first time, it it's not always going to be the best version of it. But getting that first painting out of the way and then trying it again, you can find that same flow where you can go from step to step. 